Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 752, 752, April the 15th, 2019, Monday. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's also tax day. Hopefully you all got your taxes done. I guess you got till midnight tonight to get that sucker in the mail. Uh, so uh, hopefully you've got that done. Uh, okay, so we got quite a bit to cover today. Uh, but uh, before I get into the video, just remember today is the day we vote for Dumbass of the Week. Dumbass of the Week. Some very good candidates this week. Ocasio-Cortez has probably yet, uh, got two or three excellent uh, uh, comments that uh, would um, uh, put her in the running for Dumbass of the Week. Uh, obviously, Mad Max is uh, back in a big way, and I think she'll be very strong this week for Dumbass of the Week. Uh, we have Elon Omar. Uh, we have uh, various other individuals out there. Swalwell. Uh, Schiff is always in the mix. So we have a lot of good candidates for Dumbass of the Week. Be sure and put your comments, your votes for Dumbass of the Week in the comments section of this video, and I'll review those uh, tomorrow and announce the winner for Tuesday's video. We'll announce the winner for Dumbass of the Week. Thanks so much for participating. <clears throat> now, I haven't really talked about this. Uh, it's been going on for about a week, but I just thought I'd mention, give you my thoughts on it. Uh, this idea uh, that Trump came up with uh, to uh, send the illegals up to these sanctuary cities. <laughs> it's actually a fantastic idea. It's a great political move. And uh, a lot of people say, well, that's crazy. Uh, you know, uh, he can't do that. It's illegal, whatever. I, I don't know. I, I don't know the ins and outs of the law on that. But I do know that Eisenhower uh, did a similar thing, uh, you know, not so much for political reasons or anything like that. But, I mean, he did uh, direct... Uh, you know, where the destinations of a certain individuals coming into the country illegally where they would be sent. So, you know, there's a lot more politics surrounding this than there was back then. But, you know, I would say that Trump is not too far off here. And I think that there is a way to do this. And if I were advising Trump before he just came out and said, you know, we'll, we'll send them up to sanctuary cities, you know, I think there was a way, probably a better way to handle that and get the same result. So, if I were to have been advising Trump, I probably would have said, well, how about this? How about we say that when we reach that point where these people who, who come in and they have a kid, and therefore, if they have a child with them, someone under 18, they arrive at the border, they're illegal. If they have a child, we can only hold them for 20 days. After 20 days, we release them out into the country. Now, they're supposed to attend a court hearing, but they never do. 2%. 2% actually attend the court hearing. They're just released into the country. Okay, so this is what Trump is primarily focused on. So I think that the way to deal with this and the way to get kind of where Trump is wanting to get to without it just being straight up looking very political, and I support it, by the way, 100%, but um, what he should have done is said, okay, from now on, when we get those people that we have to release into the country, what we're going to do is we're going to give them their choice of where they want to go. We're going to give the illegals their choice of where they, what their destination will be inside the continental United States. We're not going to send them to Hawaii or Alaska, but the other 48 states continental, uh, within, the, within the continental U.S., we're going to give them their choice of where they want to go. And then, of course, I would provide them also to assist them, I would provide them with a list of all 48 states. And... I will put them in order of who offers the most generous benefits to them so that they can look at that list and determine where they would like to go. Now, and of course, places that offer sanctuary for them would obviously be at the very top of the list. My guess is that most of them would choose to go there. So you would essentially be giving the illegals the choice on where they would be sent, and uh, you would assist them in that effort by helping them get to the place that would help them the most. And that is exactly how I would have laid this out. It would have been much harder for Democrats to fight against it or say it's all political or turn it into a political football because, hey, you're giving these people the choice of where they want to go. Not only that, but you're assisting them by letting them know which states or cities that they can go to where they'll have the greatest amount of benefits to them. That's how I would have done it. 
Now, let's move on to the next thing. Well, we now have, uh, uh, it's been raging kind of uh, behind the scenes. We've all been watching it for a while now. This um, civil war going on within the Democratic Party, which is inevitable, and it's only going to get worse. And I assure you that by the time we get into uh, late summer, when we get into the fall, when people really start paying attention uh, to the Democratic field of candidates and thinking about the election, this is when you're really going to see the things come out and things are going to get really ugly. Obviously, we had the story last week that um, the Democratic Committee is now barring uh, anyone connected to the Democratic Party establishment from associating with, having fundraising activities with, having any type of political organization or efforts with anyone uh, of the Democrats who are part of the Socasio cortez movement to throw out all the incumbents and to replace them with progressives. So now there's kind of a war. Uh, they've been shut out. The Democrat National Committee has shut out the organizations around Ocasio-Cortez that want to get rid of establishment Democrats. Now they've gone another step farther, and this one seems to hit right at Bernie specifically. And so Bernie is now uh, attacking back. He's sent them a letter to let them know how unhappy he is with what they're doing. So. Bernie is now at war with Think Progress. Think Progress, obviously, is just a name of an organization attached to much larger organizations, uh, funded by all the big wig establishment Democrats. Soros, the rotten Reverend Clinton, is a huge contributor to Think Progress, and a bunch of others. So, Think Progress, uh, as it turns out, was the source of the smear on Bernie for being a millionaire. As you recall last week, um, I, I don't know which media organization on the left it was, but I think it was MSNBC, may have been CNN, could have been someone else. But the left media uh, started running this story talking about uh, how Bernie Sanders is actually a multimillionaire <laughs> because he's always talking about the millionaires and billionaires. And so they put this smear story out there on Bernie, and he had to go out and defend himself against this and he basically said, well, you know, I wrote a book, and that's how I got rich. No, no, no. He, Yeah, he, he sold some copies of the book. No question about that. He probably sold a million copies. I don't know. He probably made a million dollars on it. But Bernie's gotten rich. He's been a millionaire for a very long time. He's gotten rich uh, as a senator. Uh, he's gotten rich, richer in the last two election cycles by raising one hell of a lot of money and pocketing a lot of it. Uh, I have no doubt that he was paid off in some way, shape, or form. Uh, in 2016 to uh, bail out. No doubt in my mind, he took cash, he took money, something uh, to walk away. So anyway, Think Progress is the source of the smear on Bernie. And so Bernie says in a statement, and this is in the letter that he wrote them, uh, that they are trying to start a civil war within the party and it's going to get Trump reelected. Well, Trump's going to be reelected anyway, but Yes, they are starting a civil war within the party. There already is a civil war within the Democratic Party, and it started back in 2016. I mean, it's been going on. It's just that they were able to put Bernie down because he took the buy-off. Uh, he took the payout. He walked. Had Bernie stayed stiff-spined and stayed in the, in the game, uh, it would have been much more pronounced than it is today. But now that he's back and we have a new campaign, it's just been, uh, uh, you know, Kick, re, re, you know, restarted. Uh, they've kind of restarted the entire thing, and it will continue to get to play out this way until finally the far left wing of the Democratic Party, the progressives, uh, uh, get really, really angry and, and get really, really active, and that'll all begin toward the late summer, uh, early fall of this coming year is when you really see the things come out, and you really see things get very, very ugly at that time, and uh, it will be a joy for all of us to watch. So there we go, the war within the Democratic Party continuing to build, look for this whole thing to blow, to a blow up sometime in the late summer, early fall of this year. Kamala Harris answering questions out at a campaign stop and she admits that she is a gun owner and that she owns gun, a gun for personal protection. <laughs> I can't wait to see her debating against Swalwell who's going to make his entire campaign about uh, and about uh, uh, an anti-gun campaign, pretty much. 
which the Democrats are not going to be real happy to hear about because generally when it comes time for a general election, that's the last thing they want to talk about because they know it's so unpopular in so many places where they need to win. Swalwell is not going to be around probably, I, I don't even think he'll make it into the fall, to be quite honest with you. Um, so it's not really going to matter much, but uh, just so you know, Kamala Harris carries a gun. Yep. She doesn't want you to carry a gun, though. That's right. She supports laws that will prevent you and me from carrying a gun, but her and her friends, oh, all the guns that they want. No problem. Now, let's talk about this John Solomon article that was recently posted, I think, either on Friday or Saturday <clears throat> at um, the National Review. And he posted an article where he had some questions for Assange on the Russia collusion. I'm not 100% in agreement with uh, Solomon's take on Julian Assange. He kind of takes the establishment line in a way that Assange, he kind of accepts that the Russians did hack the DNC and that WikiLeaks released them. Okay, I don't believe that the Russians hacked the DNC. Assange just said that the Russians did not hack the DNC. It was no state actor. But he does ask some very good questions in this article. And uh, here are just a few of them in case you have not seen this article. He asks some of the same questions I was asking uh, the last two days. Uh, he's asking, why was there no Sanders slash Russia probe? Seeing as how at the time that the leaks occurred was during the Democratic primary, and the leaks were designed to help Bernie de uh, defeat the rotten Reverend Clinton. Everyone wants to look at this thing and say, yeah, this is about the Russians trying to help uh, Trump and hurt Hillary. That's why they supposedly gave the emails to WikiLeaks. But at the time, it we weren't in the general election. We were in the primary election. And so at that time, the person who would have been harmed would have been the rotten Reverend Clinton, but the person who would have benefited would have been Bernie. Bernie, not Trump. At that time, uh, at that time, it, it wasn't, well, yeah, it was pretty clear that Trump would be the nominee, but um, no one thought he had any chance to win. And the person who really um, would have benefited at that time, uh, had he taken advantage of it, was Bernie Sanders. But even if Bernie's not smart enough to know that, certainly the FBI should have looked at that and said, wait a minute, who would have benefited from that? Well, Bernie Sanders. Was, is it possible the Russians were trying to help Bernie? After all, we know about Bernie's love affair with communism. We've all seen that pic with a shirtless Bernie sitting in a Moscow bar, boozing it up. That was in the days of the Soviet Union, too, not the Russia. That was in the days of the, you know, of the Soviet Union. He was sitting shirtless in a bar in Moscow, getting tanked, singing uh, uh, commie folk songs. So with all that in mind, and Bernie's positions over the years, the fact that the Russians came out to help him and hurt Hillary by releasing those emails, allegedly, why didn't they launch an investigation into Bernie and the Bernie Russia collusion delusion? Pretty good question, don't you think? Here's an even better question, which I asked yesterday, which I'll ask again because Solomon's asking it this time. Why hasn't Julian Assange been indicted for criminal collusion with the Kremlin? We're told by Giuliani, who knows a lot about what's in the Mueller report, that it's going to tell us that the Russians um, were the ones who were behind hacking the DNC and they gave the emails to WikiLeaks and they released them. That's what the, that's what the Mueller report's going to tell us. Well, if that's the case, well, then why hasn't Julian Assange been arrested? I mean, Uncle Bob uh, indicted 20-some-odd uh, uh, Russian trolls who worked at the old troll farm and two firms supposedly uh, three firms initially although one of them didn't didn't eat wasn't even existence at the time this all went down so it turns out two firms uh, these other two firms that are supposedly connected to the GRU um, so if you have all this evidence uh, why didn't why didn't uh, Mueller if he's gonna say that it was the Russians who definitely hacked the DNC and gave the stuff to WikiLeaks, then why isn't Julian Assange and WikiLeaks being indicted for criminal collusion with, with uh, the Kremlin? That's not why he's being brought back here to the U.S. 
I think we all know the question, of the, the answer to that. Another question, why not charge Assange with Russian conspiracy? Because in the other charges, what they're, that they're looking at uh, extraditing him for, there's a statute of limitations, as we already talked about, of five years. We're well beyond that. It's been eight years. So then they can get another, another three if they can show that it was connected to terrorism. But that's going to be very, very difficult to do, almost impossible, which is why everyone's asking questions. So it begs the most logical, obvious question, why would they want to indict him for that charge, which they have almost a practically 1% maybe chance of getting a conviction on, when they could simply slap him with a, a conspiracy in the Russian collusion? I mean, it says in the Mueller report that, that uh, WikiLeaks um, released the emails, the DNC emails, which were given to them by the Russians. That's what the, that's what the Mueller report is going to tell us. So if that's the case... Why wouldn't they? Because after all, there's no statute of limitations for conspiracy. Can anyone figure that one out? Why would you not charge Assange with criminal conspiracy when it says right there in the Mueller report that we're going to find out that the DNC gave the, uh, that the Russians gave the uh, emails, which they hacked or had someone hack for them, to WikiLeaks, which would mean Assange will be caught up in the Russian conspiracy, but they don't indict him for that. No, no, no. They indict him, which has no statute of limitations, and for which they've already s clearly stated in the Mueller report he's guilty of. But they don't charge him with that, Russian collusion uh, conspiracy. No, they charge him for something which they have a much lower, much, much lower chance of getting a conviction on. I think generally the answer to all these questions uh, is because essentially uh, if, if, if the government were to charge Assange with the Russian conspiracy, and that would certainly be hinging upon the fact that he released the, the, um, the emails, then that means that the state, <clears throat> the government, would have to prove that Assange in fact uh, did receive these emails from the Russians and he, and he released them. That's what they would have to prove. Assange wouldn't have to prove he didn't do it. They would have to prove that Assange did do it. They would have to come up with the evidence to prove that Assange received that stuff from the Russians and released it. That is what the state would have to prove. And of course, they cannot prove that. They know they cannot prove that. And they know, obviously, otherwise, Assange could almost certainly 100% prove just the opposite. That's why they have not charged him with Russian collusion conspiracy. There you go. That was pretty easy. Oh, by the way, Julian Assange does have a kill switch. He does have a kill switch. Here's a story you may not have heard. A former Democratic Democami candidate for Georgia's 10th district, has her name is Kelly Collins, has been charged with murder for killing her former campaign treasurer. His name is Curtis Kane. Kane was found in his apartment with a fatal gunshot wound. Collins ran uh, for the Democrat, ran for the Democrats in Georgia's tent, primarily on a um, primarily on a gun control issue. She ran primarily on the gun control issue. Now, of course, she's uh, turned herself in. And I guess she's admitting that she did it. Well done. Then we have the Rotten Reverend. She can't keep her mouth shut for a minute. The Rotten Reverend on the arrest of, or the, yeah, the arrest of Julian Assange and is being extradited back here. She had the gall, she had the gall to tweet out that Assange has to answer for what he's done, at least as it has been charged. Oh, man. Woo! Is that a cringy comment coming from the Rotten Reverend or what? He has to be, he has to answer for what he's done? You gotta be kidding me. Man, this woman, she is pure freaking evil, man. Absolutely. Well, uh, there's a couple people who, a lot of people uh, in Washington, D.C. right now, Comey, Lynch, uh, a whole lot of other people, Strzok Page, you know all the people we're talking about. They have a lot of problems. But, in the last couple of days, I've been looking at a couple other people 
who also have a lot of problems, and their names come up from time to time, but they've been able to sort of avoid the direct accusations. As we know, uh, Nunes submitted on Sunday uh, these people to uh, AG Barr. Eight criminal indictments or referrals, eight criminal referrals, and he said some of the people we probably know they're automatic because they're the people we talk about. We talk about all the time: Strzok and Page, Comey. But he said there might be a couple people on the list that that we have heard of, but they're probably not usually uh, they're not they have not been discussed very much. But they're they're very key players uh, who will be uh, as part of that criminal referral. And I think that the two people that he's talking about, I'd be willing to bet on it based on some information that's been bouncing around the last couple of days. I'd say those two people are most likely Bill Priestep, who was, of course, Peter Strzok's boss, the head of counterintelligence, and uh, he's the one that Comey tried to scapegoat as well, and also Susan Rice, the former national security advisor, who was, of course, uh, in charge of all the unmaskings, of which there were thousands. So let's go through just a couple things regarding Priestep and why uh, I think he might be in some serious trouble and should be. In, in uh, testimony, uh, Jordan asked Priestep about three trips that he took overseas during the 2016 election. Priestep would not say where those trips were. We now know that all three of the trips were in London. He wouldn't say why. That was the, He actually did tell Jordan why, but that was redacted. But we now know why. Uh, he went there to meet with a foreign partner, a foreign government partner, British Intelligence. His first trip was on May 9th. His second trip was on July 31st. And then he went again on another trip. Not exactly sure of the date, but it was sometime after July 31st and before the election. The funny thing about all three of these dates, according to sources uh, in the know, <clears throat> they all three occurred on really key specific times when there were things going on in London on those very dates. Of course, we know on the May 9th date, that was exactly in the week where Papagalopoulos had been with Halper, then he went to meet Misfit, then he came back uh, to speak again with Halper. That pre-step was in town in London that week. He was also in town on the very day and the week and the days after. Uh, he, he went there on the day that they opened the counterintelligence operation crossed by Hurricane, July 31st, and he was there for another week. And then, of course, he was back there again a week later when another key uh, thing happened, which it doesn't say what that is, but you can uh, only guess it was probably something to do with the Carter Page FISA. Now, Priestup was going to London when uh, significant events were happening. Papagalopoulos contacts with Halper and Misfit, and, uh, of course, the beginning of Crossfire Hurricane. Priestup says the FBI does not use the word spy, maybe only in reference to assets from foreign countries doing intelligence work. So if it's a foreign asset, then they're okay with the word spy. But as far as the FBI and the DOJ are concerned, they do not use the word spy. It's not in their lexicon. They do not use the term. It's, it's, it's like taboo in the FBI culture to actually use the word spy. That's why you see the, um, the resistance to that word after Barr used the word spy seeing Comey and Clapper and Brennan, all these guys, oh, we don't talk about the word spy. Uh, that's, uh, the word spy is not allowed in the dictionary at the FBI or DOJ, or Intel community for that matter, I guess. Guess that's changed. Here's some Q&A with Priestep from his testimony. Question, are you aware of any FBI investigations motivated by potential bias? Priestep said, I am not. Priestep was asked, are you aware of any DOJ investigation motivated by political bias? Priestep said, no. Uh-oh, there's two lies. What, three? Here you go. Priestep was asked, are you aware of any actions ever taken to damage the Trump campaign at the highest levels of the DOJ or FBI? Priestep said, no. He was asked, are you aware of any actions ever taken against Donald Trump at the highest levels of the DOJ or FBI for the purpose of politically undercutting him? Priestep said no. Oh, wow, there's five counts of uh, lying or misleading the 
Congress right there. And so as you can see, Priestep may very well be one of those people uh, that Nunez was talking about because these are questions that his committee was asking and you just heard the answers and every one of them were lies. In addition to the fact that he also qualifies uh, as being part of this conspiracy because of the fact that he took the three trips to London at very key times when things were going on in the Russiagate uh, uh, hoax uh, that they were setting up. Uh, and so it stands to reason that he certainly was more in the know than, the, than what he wants to pretend he was. And I think that's why he is definitely one of the people who um, may be on Nunez's list. And now on Barr's list. Not that he wasn't before. The other person I, I think that's uh, probably on Nunez's list that, know, that a lot of people have forgotten about is Susan Rice. Remember, she was the National Security Advisor. She would have been the one who would have ordered the um, unmaskings. Uh, and, of course, uh, basically what she did was she spied on um, members of her political opponents during a presidential campaign and then unmasked their identities and then made sure that their identities, that their names were leaked to the press. And I think if you want to look at the number one suspect for the Michael Flynn release, that almost certainly would point to, most likely, Susan Rice uh, would have been the one, probably, um, because it's national security type stuff. It is Michael Flynn. The FBI probably wouldn't have touched that. The CIA, they would be involved in maybe setting him up and doing things like that, but they could not arrange for the unmaskings and uh, once getting the names of the people unmasked wouldn't probably have been the ones to leak it. That was probably something that came from the National Security Council. That would have been Susan Rice. Most likely she is the one that is is responsible for, well, we know she's responsible for all the unmaskings, uh, but she's most likely the person, most likely the per, to have been the person who leaked a lot of the names of the people who were unmasked uh, to the media, and specifically Michael Flynn. I think Susan Rice is going to need to lawyer up. I think she's one of the people on Nunez's list. Papagalopoulos was on Larry King on Friday night. Now, he didn't say anything. I mean, he dropped a couple big bombshells last week. Uh, the biggest one, I think, one of the biggest ones, he, two of the biggest ones, he thinks Carter Page was uh, working for the other team, and uh, he believed that um, Misfit and Halper likely were wearing a wire. Then, of course, we had Trey Gowdy on Fox News a couple days ago, basically either letting it slip, he slipped, let it slip, wasn't supposed to say it, or now it's okay to say it. Uh, he, he confirmed that, yes, there were at least one, if not two, people definitely wearing a wire with a Papagalopoulos conversation, either Misfit or Halper or both. Uh, but he spent a little bit more time because Larry King actually uh, wanted to dig in a little bit more onto the before everything started going down in London, kind of the backstory on Papagalopoulos, which we all know he was working at the Hudson Institute, blah, 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 blah. But uh, Larry King got him to get a little bit more in depth. And, and some of the terms and some of the language and the way that Papagalopoulos described his situation at the Hudson Institute, I thought was uh, worth uh, mentioning. Um, he used the exact phrase that he was working at the Hudson Institute and that he was working with Bush, W. Bush, neocons. He mentioned them by name. He mentioned about five or six of them. Uh, the two main ones you would recognize, Douglas Fife and Scooter Libby. Hardcore neocons, high-level neocons. And he was working with them on these deals that would have been beneficial to, of course, as you can guess, Israel uh, for this uh, oil, this uh, energy development in the Middle East and the Mediterranean. And he referred to Fife and Libby and other neocons there that he was working with as members and colleagues. And um, this, I think, the reason he was using this language was to make it clear to Larry King that he was on the other side of Obama. He and the people at Hudson Institute, these neocons he was working with, 
were obviously looking at uh, some some uh, energy policies that they wanted to implement that would have been 180 degrees opposite what Obama wanted, and that's why he believes he was targeted. So, you know, it wasn't that Papagopoulos wanted to make something to do about the fact that he was working closely with neocons. It's not for the purpose I'm discussing it. Uh, he just wanted to lay it out there to let Larry King know he was working with a group of people who were ideologically opposed to Obama and his administration, and specifically on energy policy in the Middle East. <clears throat> he says and told Larry King that he leveraged his ties with all of these neocons and people formerly in the George W. Bush administration. He leveraged all of them to get a hitch on one of the 2015 campaigns. And the first one that he got onto was Ben Carson's campaign. And he was on Ben Carson's campaign until Carson dropped out. Then he moved over to the Trump campaign. And largely, that was with a lot of help from Corey Lewandowski. Apparently, Lewandowski and, um, and uh, Papagopoulos had been occasionally communicating for about a year because it was back uh, about a year prior to that that um, Papagopoulos contacted Lewandowski and let him know he would be interested in playing some role as, a, as an energy consultant for a Republican candidate uh, in the 2016 election. And of course we know he says he was targeted because of policies he was working on that were opposed to the Obama administration. And uh, so nothing really new, but still pretty interesting uh, that, um, you know, he would say that and describe the people he was working with as neocons. And I, I couldn't really tell if he's like dissing them or whatever. Uh, clearly, he's not much of a neocon. You can just tell when you listen to him talk. He doesn't really seem to follow the neocon talking points. And he's a big supporter of Trump. Uh, Larry King even asked him, how do you think Trump's doing? And Papa Galop was like, hey, he's doing great. You know, I mean, he's doing great. You know, foreign policy, the economy, trade, immigration. I mean, just he, he just really praised Trump a lot. So, anyway, I think he's pretty straight. Um, but anyway, uh, one last thing too on the Assange. I mean, everybody's talking about it, and uh, yeah, I did notice, like a lot of other people, that they carried Assange out, but they weren't physically, you know, trying to harm him. They didn't throw him in the bus or anything like that. They were they were handling him very carefully. I think it may have been his request. <clears throat> I think it may have been his request to be carried out because he didn't want his feet actually touching uh, the ground for some legal reasons. And I think there was something legal as to why he requested probably to be carried out. He didn't want his feet touching the ground after he left the embassy for some legal reasons, I think. I also did notice that as he's driving away, he did give the big thumbs up and this kind of interesting smile, uh, the kind of smile that, that he's looking at you like, don't worry, um, everything's going to be all right, or, you know, stay tuned, or there's more going on here. So I'm like a lot of people are speculating. I think there's a, something else going on here. Um, and uh, I'm kind of a dreamer in a lot of ways, I guess, because uh, I do hope that the reason they're bringing him back here is so that he can provide information regarding the origins of the Russian conspiracy. That's what, my, that's what I would like to have happen. But honestly, uh, I think it's probably more likely that when they get him back here, they're probably going to load him up on a bunch more charges, charges that have to do with like national security stuff. I think that they will never see a public hearing because of various security reasons, classified information, whatever. Uh, and I think that they're going to try to claim him up is, is what I think. But I will be pleasantly surprised if, in fact, um, he provides some information that disproves the Russian collusion theory. That would be my hope. I would say there's probably a 2% chance of that probably a 98% chance they're going to bring him back here just to control him and shut him up, put him away, put the lid on him. That's my guess. He does have a kill switch, though. Get your vote in for Dumbass of the Week, and I'll be back tomorrow with more Towergate. See you guys. Bye.